yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, uh, cooling with radiant, which is kind of an interesting uh, subject, an interesting topic, and it's getting a lot more traction here. It's been used different places in the world for some years, but it's starting to catch on here. So uh, I couldn't be more proud to introduce today's uh, presenters, my son, Max Rohr, who's been uh, kind of worked up uh, in the industry with me for 30 some years now. So he's been through different uh, aspects of the industry. So I think he's in a good spot and a good position to talk with uh, with some knowledge on this topic, both from seeing it done and also being with the uh, the design end of it now in the Ray Help um, business. So um, yeah, there's my boy. So uh, take away, Max, I know you have a lot to get through here. So we'll just get right into it. Sure. And uh, thanks again to the Kalefi team for having me. This is one of my favorite topics to uh, cover. This is something that at Rayhow we're really passionate about because we think there's huge potential for this uh, kind of across the uh, North America where there may be some regions that are a little bit more interested in radiant heating than others. We think it's a great fit in a lot of different places, but radiant cooling opens up places like Florida and all sorts of other uh, markets that aren't traditional radiant places. So kind of to start with, if you're listening to this webinar, you have the superpowers to build these exceptional buildings. So radiant cooling can play a bigger part uh, in these buildings that you're creating if you're an engineer, if you're a mechanical contractor or whatever your role is. So in this hour, I'll identify some ways to best leverage this radiant cooling technology so you can identify projects uh, that can set the pace for kind of comfort and energy efficiency. Radiant cooling is an exceptional way to kind of push the, the envelope for high performance building and we'll kind of show you some of the, the stories and uh, technologies that are at play here. Okay, so uh, my dad did the introduction a little bit. This is when my hair looked a little bit better before the, uh, the coronavirus. Uh, my wife Jules cut my hair uh, a couple about a week ago and it's growing in okay but um it definitely this was a better headshot to use um so what i do uh, i like to say that i teach people to move energy well with water uh, buildings account for almost 40 percent of the total u.s energy consumption according to the eia and we think that with radiant heating radiant cooling some of these other high performance technologies we can do that better so we think that again you guys have the superpowers and the tools to be able to do this uh, and we'll we'll show you what can be done with radiant cooling. So if you're not familiar with Rayhow, it is a company of about 20,000 employees all over the world, 170 locations. We make uh, things from the bumper for a new Mercedes car uh, to window profiles and edge banding for tables. And then in the building solutions department, our primary product is PEX pipe. So I'm going to spend just a, a couple minutes talking about uh, the PEX pipe to begin with too, but the agenda for today, we're gonna to talk about thermal comfort. We're gonna talk about energy efficiency with heating and cooling sources, uh, explain the considerations for system design to best utilize this technology and kind of identify when it's a good fit and when it's not. Uh, some of the, the questions that we get, uh, I'll address later in the presentation that someone will call and say, is radiant cooling uh, a great technology to use for my uh, Miami, house that is, you know, has an open patio that the windows are open all the time. Uh, no, not really. <laughs> Probably not the best use case, but we'll identify some of the, the best commercial new construction projects that really fit well with radiant cooling. Uh, and then the my favorite part of that is just kind of talking about actual case studies. So you don't have to think of this as a theoretical technology. This is something that uh, we've been using in the industry for a while and have some, some cool uh, use cases to demonstrate great fits for radiant cooling. So a lot of what I'll talk about, this is meant to be an introduction into radiant cooling. There's a lot more to talk about here. If you want to get into specific projects, that's something that you can ask any of the radiant designers that you work with to kind of go over case by case, how to apply these technologies. We're going to take a little bit of a background uh, tour of the physics of radiant cooling and then look at some of the best applications. Okay, so what is radiant? Um, a method of conditioning a space by warming or cooling its surfaces. So in the little graphic on the right there, you can see that in this picture, there are cutaways of radiant in the floor, in the walls, in the ceilings. So you can do all of that. Really, radiant isn't just a floor technology. It's not a floor warming technology. Uh, it's something that can be in any surface, really, that you have line of sight with. So that's uh, that really gives you a lot of flexibility. If you can imagine what we're doing with radiant heating, 
instead of having a single cast iron uh, radiator over by the window in this picture where that couch is, we've taken that radiator, we've replaced the material with PEX, and then we've stretched it out over the entire floor and then hidden it. So it's the same thing, it's just a huge radiator and we use PEX pipe to kind of make all of this happen. But that's all we're doing is we're really increasing the surface area of the radiator and we're putting it under a surface so it's not physically in the occupied space, which is sometimes uh, something that architects really like that you kind of hide it in the ground. So uh, a little bit about the reason that we use PEX. Some of these radiant systems in the past were wrought iron. Uh, very difficult to work with, very unfriendly chemically, I guess, to concrete. So a lot of those early systems didn't last very long. The technology, you know, the, the heart was in the right place, but the material wasn't a great fit. So PEX is better for radiant heating and radiant cooling systems because it's flexible. It's not uh, reacting to the concrete the same way as wrought iron, uh, high temperature, high pressure applications are fine too. So that's why we use PEX. Some of the properties of PEX, really if you're looking at exceeding any of these things for a radiant heating or radiant cooling project, we probably wanna talk about it. I mean, normally we're keeping at very low temperatures for heating and very warm temperatures for cooling. So uh, the PEX is completely overqualified for a, a heating and cooling project. And then we're gonna kind of come back to uh, some of this. The reason I mentioned this is that traditionally with a radiant cooling project, uh, we're going to do five eighths inch pipe diameter. We're gonna do six inch spacing. So the chart here kind of shows some typical uh, outside diameter bend radius. So for five eighths pipe, six inches is how you can easily bend that without heat or anything like that. Uh, and that's typically what we're doing for radiant cooling. It's a more specific spacing and pipe diameter than radiant heating, maybe uh, there's a little bit more flexibility in the pipe size and the spacing, and we'll kind of talk about why that's the case. Okay, so before we get into comfort, uh, we've got a poll. If, uh, if Mary, you wanna launch that, that poll, I'm kind of interested to see the answers that we get to this poll before we get into the, the comfort slides. So the answers we got 70% said occupant comfort. So that's great. 25% said energy efficiency and 5% said indoor air quality. So I think that that's kind of interesting. I asked that question uh, partially because we need to do all three of these things to be the best version of ourselves in this industry. But I wanted to see kind of where you start. And the cool thing about radiant heating and radiant cooling is we can do all of these three things at the same time uh, and that really all of them should be in place to have a high performance building that's up to the ASHRAE standards that apply to uh, comfort and ventilation and things like that. So, okay, great. That's uh, We should be, as, as Robert Bean usually says, designing buildings for people, uh, not uh, hoping that people are going to be comfortable in order to meet code. That's kind of the wrong way to do it, but I know that he's very uh, passionate about that topic. So. This slide um, is from uh, healthyheating.com, Robert Bean's website. So a human body at rest is what we're talking about here. And 62% of the energy, the heat energy from a person at rest is gonna be transmitted by radiation. So there's a little bit of convection, a little bit of respiration and evaporation with sweat, but radiance really the primary way that we're exchanging heat energy with our environment and with our environment in a building as well. So uh, a new buildings institute study, they had 1,645 building occupants and they found that in a space with a radiant system, a person has a 66% chance of having an equal or higher temperature satisfaction than an all air conditioned building. So this is one of the tricky things about comfort is that you'll never get a, an honest answer that says 100% of people are comfortable in a radiant system because that's just not really how comfort works. It's a very personal thing and you could take 100 people and put them in the same room and get 100 different answers for if they're comfortable or not. But occupant studies are a great, great way to actually figure out site specific if people are enjoying the environment they have to live in or work in or whatever the case is. 
So when we talk about radiant systems uh, for cooling specifically, there are kind of three different categories that we lump these different systems into. So embedded thermal masses are, are what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of this presentation. That's gonna be your PEX pipe in a concrete mass generally in a floor or in a ceiling. Uh, ceiling panels are very popular in Europe. They've got, uh, it's more of like a capillary kind of high, again, surface area panel that you can put in like a ceiling tile and kind of link them together. Haven't had as much traction in the States, but it is something uh, that is out there and is another way to do radiant cooling. And then the third one is a chilled beam, which we would actually not consider a radiant system by definition because it doesn't meet the more than 50% 50, 50 radiation criteria. It's mostly convection. So sometimes chilled beam gets lumped in with radiant cooling. Um, it's not really, uh, primarily radiant, I guess, would be our answer to that. But it is another way to, to cool a space with water, basically. Okay, so with radiant heating, what we're doing is heat is emitting from a network of PEX pipe that's in the concrete, warming the surfaces above in the space. So in the graphic on the right there, you can see the uh, it's a radius, radiant. So all of the heat is coming up from the pipe and into the space, warming the floor. And then there's a little bit of, I put in some natural convection swirls here too. So when you do a loop CAD design, a design software uh, calculation for a heat loss for a radiant system, it's gonna encompass both of these. So the natural convection that you'll get just because the surface of the floor is warmer than the air, you're gonna get a little bit of air movement there. There's not a fan doing that. It's just the natural convection of the you know the air in the space that's going to be a little bit of the the transfer into the room um, but primarily radiant again so with radiant cooling we're just flipping it upside down so now the coolest part of the room is going to be the pex pipe in the concrete mass so what that means is that the warm objects in the occupied space all of that heat energy is being absorbed or sponged or pulled down into the, the slab or into the ceiling in some cases, because warm surfaces always radiate to cool ones, regardless of the direction. So warm air rises, but hot's always going to cold. So uh, as Siggy puts it in Hydronics 23, heat always moves from a material at some temperature to another material at a lower temperature. So to take it back to like the absolute basis of the physics, we're just dictating what that cool surface is, that cool temperature um, in the actively controlled uh, PEX piping in the slab. So um, I think that at the heart of all of this, that for a given temperature rise, liquid water can absorb almost 3,500 times more heat than the same volume of air. So what we're doing here, and maybe we can just end the presentation right there if that's enough justification. Water is just good at moving sensible energy around. So what we like to talk about with the radiant cooling systems is that we're going to use the, the water as the primary driver for the sensible heating load and then and the cooling load. And then we're going to use forced air or ventilation strategy of some sort to deal with the latent cooling load. So I'll kind of talk about that on the, the next slide a little bit more. But essentially what we're doing is we're putting together an efficient and a comfortable system that's going to be able to still provide great indoor air quality and then is often part of this hybrid approach that I kind of mentioned already. So what we're going to do is it's kind of like, I know that there's that, uh, that basketball uh, Chicago Bulls show is on TV right now. I haven't watched it because I'm from Utah originally and it breaks my heart every time that I think about the Chicago Bulls beating the, the Jazz twice. But what I kind of thought about in that context with this uh, yesterday is that it's kind of a John Stockton, Carl Malone scenario here <laughs> that we have uh, the radiant cooling system with the pecs in the slab is the Carl Malone. And the four stairs, kind of the John Stockton, that they actually work really well together because they're very specialized in two different things. So we're kind of decoupling the skills and we've got the four stairs dealing with the latent load and then the radiant cooling system in the, the slab is best at dealing with the sensible load. So we kind of highlight the strengths of these two systems. I know that sometimes when we 
talk about this technology with engineers or contractors, they say, well, why would you do two systems? We can do all of this with forced air. Uh, that's true. There are a lot of you out there that are designing great systems that are just forced air, but it's missing the water aspect of carrying the sensible load, really energy efficient way to do it. Uh, it's best to kind of leverage the physics of the, the molecules that are better for moving sensible energy around. And water is just better than air in that sense. So we can use both of these systems together and provide the best overall uh, comfort and energy efficiency to the, the occupants in the space. So one of the tools that we like to use to kind of model this uh, is this uh, Center for the Built Environment at the University of California, Berkeley, developed this tool, the, the Thermal Comfort Tool. So what you can do at, the, at their website is you can adjust all of these different temperatures and variables inside of a space. So you can select the metabolic rate. You can say, okay, people are in an office that I'm designing, they're gonna be typing most of the time. And they're going to be wearing, you know, it's a casual work environment. So they're gonna be wearing short sleeves shirts. Maybe it's a, a tech company or something like that. And type those two things in. The air temperature, uh, an interesting thing that we'll talk about here with the Radiant Cooling Project, 78 degree air temperature uh, is really nice if the mean radiant temperature is a little bit cooler. So we're gonna actively cool the mean radiant temperature and it doesn't make it seem like it's stuffy. If it was just air only, 78 degrees might be a little warm for most people, but if the, the surfaces are a little bit cooler because we're actually driving that, uh, the red variable that I have, uh, here on the chart, if you start dialing down that mean radiant temperature, you don't need such cold air in order to keep people in that blue shaded area, which is, again, uh, what we're, according to ASHRAE 55, kind of targeting is the best way to not make people uncomfortable. <laughs> it's kind of how it shakes out. There's not, a, there's not a bullseye for comfort, but the outside of that blue shaded area, people are more likely to be uncomfortable, which is uh, maybe uh, once lawyers and engineers get involved, that's as far as you can go with that, but it's a, it's good to target inside of that. And the CBE tool will let you kind of play with the different variables there to see how it works. So way before the CBE tool, back in uh, 1939, this chart was put together. So the, the pink shaded area, shows what people are most comfortable in or not uncomfortable. So with forced air, if you wanted to build a building with a comfortable office space, you might shoot for an air temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit, mean radiant temperature you don't control, so it's just gonna be uh, 75 degrees. So in a cooling application with radiant cooling, we can actually lower that mean radiant temperature which means we don't have to target such a cold air temperature. So the thermostat might read 75 degrees, 76 degrees or something like that, but you're still in that comfort band. So this isn't a new technology, uh, a new way of thinking about adjusting these air temperature and surface temperature, mean radiant temperature variables. Uh, it can be done a few different ways. So this is uh, what we lean on heavily for radiant cooling projects because in order to get the most energy efficiency out of the system, you do want to increase the air temperature set point uh, in cooling. Because if you just make the, you know, the same air temperature of 68 degrees and also make the slab really cold, you might be out of the comfort zone on the cold side. So that's the way that those two variables kind of at the simplest form, going back to this chart in the, you know, in the late 30s, that's how all this interacts. So another tangible way to think about this is let's say you're walking around the corner of this very simple building uh, in this in this digital landscape that I built here. Let's say it's a 40 degree Fahrenheit day, no wind, uh, no additional variables here. Do you feel warmer on the sunny side or in the shade? So the reason that you feel warmer on the sunny side is because the sun is radiating towards you. It's hitting you, you know, direct line of sight. The sun is hitting your skin but also all of the surfaces, the sidewalk and the wall next to you, those are warm from absorbing all the sun's energy. So all of the surfaces that you're next to are very warm and you feel nice and warm because all of those things are kind of, uh, you're not the coldest part of this equation on the left side of the building. Now, if we move to the person that's standing in the shade on the right side, you can't see the sun anymore. So you don't have that, that warm, very warm uh, 
you know, ball of energy that's radiating towards you. And actually on the right side, you kind of are the sun in this case, because if that wall is cold, 40 degrees, if the sidewalk is cold, it's actually pulling the heat energy out of your body into the wall, into the concrete, into the door. So that's why you feel cold. It's not because it all of a sudden the air temperature changes because you're the hottest uh, ball of energy on the right side of the building and your energy is being pulled away from you and you start to feel that sensation of cold. So what we do with radiant cooling is that same effect, just not as drastic. So we're not getting the surfaces cold, we're just cooling them a little bit so they pull the heat energy away from you and into the surface. So one of my favorite studies to talk about with radiant cooling is this Infosys building so the reason I'd like to talk about it is we very, very rarely get a single building with two different heating and cooling systems. So in this system, one half of the building is radiant cooling with the DOAS, a dedicated outdoor air system for ventilation. And then the other one is a VAV system on the other side. And the people even will cross that little bridge at the top and have a meeting on the right side and then their offices on the left side. So they experience both, which is really interesting because that rarely happens. So what they did is they did an occupant study for all the people that work in this building and they found on the radiant side 63 percent answered that they were satisfied or very satisfied with the thermal comfort where on the viv side the vav side only 45 percent said they were satisfied or very satisfied so again you can see here there's not like 100 percent of people are saying that radiant heating and radiant cooling is better but if you look at the average of all of the different occupants uh, you start to see a trend that people are, are comfortable on the radiant side. So talking a little bit more about radiant cooling systems, let's say at this point in the presentation, you're completely sold, you want to do your next project with radiant cooling. What are some questions that you want to have? What are some conversations that you want to have early? So what is the use case of the building? Is this a, a big atrium going into a courthouse? Uh, is this some sort of hot yoga studio? Is this a house uh, with a bunch of big sliding glass doors that open all summer? Uh, what are the floor and ceiling coverings? What portion of the load do you want to cover with Radiant? It's rarely 100%. So we're going to do a different uh, percentage depending on the project. Sometimes it's a huge percentage of the sensible load uh, and sometimes it's 50% or, or lower. It depends on the project. So who's in charge of the control system? And are they in communication with the engineers and contractors? If all of you are going to design the system and then they're going to throw a Nest thermostat in after the fact, that's probably not going to be the best control strategy for radiant cooling to help us control the variables that we need to to ensure comfort and performance of the system. Uh, will operable windows be considered in the project like I mentioned? And then what are the dead band considerations? So between heating and cooling, uh, how does that work? What's your plan there? Is that a, you've got a summer mode and you've got a winter mode or is it something that you want to heat and cool in the same day and one room is going to be heating and the room next door is going to be cooling or something like that those types of projects would not be a good fit for radiant cooling there are some systems that can do that uh, i think it's a, a kind of an energy travesty to heat one room and then on the other side of a two by four cool the other room uh, but that would be something to note that for radiant cooling, we'd want to stay away from those types of projects. So the good news about radiant cooling is that Ray Howe didn't write any of these rules. The things that we design according to with our design software and other people in the industry that are working with these projects, they're paying attention to ASHRAE 55 as kind of the guiding light here. So for, the, for human comfort, floor temperature should be limited uh, to between 84 degrees Fahrenheit on the hot side and warmer than 66 degrees on the cooling side. Uh, and then in Canada, CSA uh, B214 has its own kind of different mix of the limitations depending on what the, the use case is. So bathroom and a swimming pool are going to be different from just an office space or something like that. But if we look at the, you know, the 84 and 66 as kind of the bumpers that we stay in between, that's what helps us uh, work with these systems. So as kind of a way to illustrate the sensation of working in an air-based system versus a radiant cooling hybrid system, in both cases we have ventilation air. We need to get fresh air into the building, we need to have air for people to breathe. Uh, if we just built you know, these really tight 
buildings according to you know the most stringent energy codes and uh, you know net zero buildings with no windows and no ventilation, you would pass out eventually. You have to have some fresh air moving into these spaces. We also need to address the humidity in these in these rooms. But if you look at the air base system on the left, in order to do that with all air, you're gonna need a little bit bigger duct work potentially, and you're gonna need to have cold air. So in some cases, people can feel drafty if they're right under uh, the, the cold air coming into the room through the, the vent there. And then also the computer and your feet are still hot. You're still just kind of blowing cold air around the space. So the, the illustration on the right, we may be able to downsize the, the ventilation component depending on the project since we're just addressing the latent load if there's not a huge latent load in the space. And then what we're doing is we're cooling the floor in this illustration. So this person has a little bit cooler feet and then doesn't have a big you know, high velocity, low air temperature, a uh, blast of cold air coming down onto their head. So it's a little bit uh, more mellow temperature all the way around here. And that's one of the reasons that, that people like the comfort provided by radiant cooling. So another way to illustrate the hybrid system from a latent and sensible cooling load standpoint is the air-based system on the left. What you're doing is you're sizing that A-coil that's in the wall there for both the sensible and the latent cooling load, but you're gonna need a, a bigger A coil to cover all of the sensible load. So larger equipment, larger ductwork may be required. The picture on the right, we're actually taking some of the sensible cooling load and pulling it right into the floor. So in this particular case, without having any you know, specific sizing here, we're able to downsize the A coil and downsize the ductwork because all we need to address is the latent cooling load just the physics of how that A coil is going to work, you're also going to cool the air a little bit so you get a little bit of a sensible cooling boost there, but it can be downsized because we're taking more of that load into the floor in order to best uh, transmit the, the heat back to a, a chiller plant or you know one of the other ways that I'll talk about to cool the water. So as far as energy efficiency studies go, a couple things that we like to talk about uh, according to a, a New Building Institute study of site energy with 23 radiant buildings, they found that they're more energy efficient 90% of the time to comparable buildings, uh, which is pretty incredible, really high, uh, really good energy star scores. Um, and then another one that I like to talk about is the majority of net zero energy buildings use radiant systems. So if you're really serious about targeting those uh, super ambitious energy efficiency goals, people are looking at radiant heating to do that. At some point, it just becomes a better vehicle to drive you there. So uh, the majority of those net zero energy buildings is a, is a pretty nice badge of kind of honor for the energy efficiency of these systems. It really kind of shows how necessary it is to hit those really stringent energy efficiency standards. Uh, another one is, uh, according to the EIA, in 2012, radiant buildings use 32% less energy than uh, an average building. So this slide is why we're justifying installing two different systems to some extent, that you can absolutely do forced air only. Uh, it's one less system to put together. Think about uh, 100,000 square foot office space that can potentially save 32% on its utility bills for the life of that building. I think that that absolutely justifies taking a look at the energy efficiency gains that you can have by doing a hybrid system with forced air and radiant cooling. So going back to this Infosys building as a specific example, uh, they looked at just their utility bills at this one place and they found that it was 33% lower in energy consumption can, compared to the other side of the building. And you can see the, the stats in the, the chart on the left there for that specific uh, project. And then going back to kind of another fundamental hydronics piece here that you can move the same amount of energy with a three quarter inch pipe as you would need an 18 inch round duct to move that same amount of energy. So if we look at just the components from the distribution efficiency standpoint, with the radiant cooling project. Uh, in this case, I made it very simple that I just did a 53,000 BTU per hour load. 
uh, but it only takes 87 watts to move that around with a little circulator where if you are trying to move 53,000 BTUs worth of air, you're gonna need about a thousand watt blower, three quarter horse. So at that point, you're at 49 BTUs per hour per watt. So it's a, a lot less efficient to move that amount of energy around. Again, this is a single example, uh, not going to be the exact same number for every single case, but water is just a, a good way to move energy from the mechanical room to the occupied space, wherever that is in a building with less intrusion uh, into the, the space as well. So one of my favorite projects to talk about, this was a PPI uh, Project of the Year award winner a couple years ago. So this is a dorm building in uh, at the University of Chicago. So what was cool about this is that uh, compared to other dorm buildings, they are able to save 41% on the uh, EUI of this building. So they estimated that it would be eliminating 1,920 metric tons of CO2 emissions per year. So those are the numbers that people that are paying uh, attention to energy efficiency love to hear. It's a great story for the university, really energy efficient building. Dorms are traditionally terribly energy inefficient. Uh, so to really have a, a cool dorm project to show here was nice from the energy efficiency standpoint, from the dollars and cents standpoint, for the, you know, the whoever's paying the bill at this university and that type of thing. But what was really interesting is that they were also able to make this building look really beautiful. It's a studio gang architect project. And in humid Chicago in the summer, they were able to let the people in the dorm rooms keep operable windows. So if you're an engineer and you think of radiant cooling with operable windows in Chicago, your blood runs cold, that that should be some sort of condensation nightmare. Uh, but the combination of uh, DBHMS, the engineering firm, Mortensen Construction and Mechanical Inc., they all kind of worked together and figured out a system that if the people in the dorms open their windows, it closes the zone valve for that room for cooling. So they can open their windows all they want, their floor is not going to get cold anymore. So it's gradually going to come back up to the ambient air temperature. So you can't have a cold floor and an open window at the same time. So they were able to kind of give the students who live in these buildings the advantage of the, uh, the comfort and the energy efficiency, roll it all into one with still the, you know, the ability to open a window, which is, is a pretty nice thing for this project. So really one of my favorite projects, really a, a beautiful campus, and uh, I think a perfect example of radiant cooling uh, for a creative project. So why don't we take a pause here and launch the second poll. I wanna get an idea of, uh, as far as implementing radiant cooling before we talk about it, where everybody would, would answer these two questions. So we've got one more poll. Okay, so the results are, 43% uh, said uh, radiant cooling in the floor, 57 said in the ceiling. So I wanted to kind of talk about this a little bit more because there's not a right or a wrong answer here, uh, but I'll kind of show you the difference and uh, what you can look forward to in some of the different system design aspects here. So a common insulation for cooling is to put radiant cooling in a slab. So let's say it's the first story of this building on the right there. So we've got insulation below, we've got the PEX pipe embedded in concrete. We're fairly close to the surface of the concrete. We don't wanna be below 18 inches of concrete or anything like that because the more like a capillary, like your blood vessels that we can put uh, a network of pipe close to the surface, uh, probably two inches down minimum to protect it from uh, you know somebody putting something into the concrete floor or, or whatever. You don't want to have it right at the surface. You want to have it close enough that there's not all of that th the thermal mass of the concrete that you have to work through in order to cool the slab. So this is unidirectional, uh, which means that you've got the insulation below, and then you're pulling warm energy from the space above down into the tube. Uh, that's kind of the way that you're uh, setting up the system. Another way to do it, and this is what they did for the upper floors of the University of Chicago dorms, is what is called a, a TABS system, um, which is basically uninsulated above and below concrete. So the radiant uh, floor of the third story is also the radiant ceiling of the second story. So in this case, 
you are pulling warm energy out of the space from above and below so you've effectively doubled your surface area because the ceiling and the floor uh, are absorbing this sensible energy and then you also have the natural convection so it's a it's a little hard to see but i drew on the slide that the natural convection on the the floor below is a little bit higher so because warm air rises you're going to have a hotter pocket of air against a cool uh, surface at the ceiling so you get a little bit more capacity so for the engineers who've been waiting patiently on the call to finally see uh, a graph that has some outputs and things i know this is kind of the engineering red meat that a lot of people are looking for here if we're staying within these ASHRAE standard 55 limits for floor temperature range so we've got 66 degree boundary on the low end 84 degree on the high end and then we're also setting the air temperature uh, you know 68 for heating 76 for cooling here are some of the capacities that uh, we can see so the reason I asked the poll question is that uh, radiant heating is best and most effective as a floor radiant cooling is best and most effective as a ceiling so these tab systems can be a good way to go for multi-story projects but you can take a look at the the chart on the right here and see that floor heating uh, 19 to 31 BTUs per hour per square foot is reasonable. Floor cooling, 7 to uh, 12. If you put the heating in the ceiling, uh, you lose a little bit of output there, but with cooling, you gain some. So those are things that we like to kind of look at when we're talking about a project. If they want more BTUs per square foot, uh, we could potentially look at the ceiling instead of a floor or something like that. So um, for this, we're also talking about some of the kind of math in the background, 50% max relative humidity, um, 55 degree dew point. That's kind of what we're talking about here. And, and we can run these numbers project specific and figure out what output you can expect for your floor coverings and for the humidity levels you're going to maintain. And then we can dial in the entering water temperature and, and get a good capacity for that space. So kind of project specific, but just as an example. So commercial and residential projects, which uh, would we prefer here? So commercial buildings where new slab is being poured is kind of the short answer. That's what you should be doing. If you are going to do a residential project, pretend that ASHRAE 55 and ASHRAE 62.1 or 62.2 for residential apply. So even if by code they don't, you want to do that for the thermal comfort boundaries of the floor temperatures as well as the ventilation required to keep the humidity in check. So those are the, the rules that you would want to follow even if they uh, you know, legally you don't have to use those or something because those set up the perfect environment for radiant cooling to perform well without any condensation concerns. So if you're going to do any sort of project, pretend that those rules apply. And then a couple of things to ask again, what portion of the load, the control strategy to monitor the fluid temperature and humidity levels. So what we like to look at there is the entering water temperature into a space. We want to have about three degrees above dew point just to make sure that we're covered there. And that goes all the way back to the manifold cabinet. So you really don't want to have uh, cold water close to the dew point anywhere outside of the mechanical room. The, if you're going to distribute 45 degree water and then mix it down somewhere else in the building you risk that condensation concern so three degrees above dew point is usually uh, what we like to shoot for there and then uh, we talked about the sequence of operation for switching from heating to cooling uh, by season and that type of thing so to kind of uh, recap this the decoupling the sensible and the latent loads the air system is going to be great at the latent load and any supplemental cooling that you might need depending on the project. Um, and then the ventilation part of it with ASHRAE standard 62.1, you have to do it anyway. And that, if you pay attention to those rules, Rayhow doesn't have to write any new specific radiant cooling rules. You've created an environment that's ready for radiant cooling without even knowing that you are designing for radiant cooling. So it plugs right into an ASHRAE 55 and 62.1 compliance system for the for the most part. So that's uh, that's good that those aren't some special rules that are written. And then downsizing the ventilation components could be possible in these systems. Some of the other case studies that we talk about, one of their goals was to minimize the venting in a, a, a space so you don't have the 
a big sheet metal boxes through a beautiful library or something like that. And then another topic that I know that uh, Kalefi and, and John Siegenthaler talk about a lot or are getting more creative with the energy efficient sources. So there are some places that are going full electrification that they prefer electric, uh, no you know combustible gas to power these different uh, energy plants. So water to water heat pumps, geo exchange systems, air to water heat pumps, chiller systems, electric boilers from the heating side. Uh, they're all a great fit for Radiant because all we need is warm and cool water. We don't need 210 degree Fahrenheit water on the heating side and we don't need 33 degree water on the cooling side. We just kind of want warm and cool water. So any of those technologies are a great fit for this because uh, they provide that temperature water. It's a good kind of match there. So as far as the inside of the slab layout goes, I mentioned that five inch, five eighths inch pipe and six inch spacing at the beginning. Uh, this is conceptually uh, what you could do with the radiant heating system on the left versus a radiant cooling system on the right. So we want tighter, tight, tighter tube pipe spacing, and then we're also gonna have a smaller delta T in these systems. So it's uh, radiant heating, maybe it's 20 or 30, uh, for a radiant cooling system, it's going to be a lot shorter in the single digits, uh, depending on the system. So we want to have a little bit more surface area, a little bit more uh, volume in a, in the space in order to get higher capacities than you would if you just took a heating system and started running cold water through it. Then the building control strategy, there's no special type of sensor or control strategy here. We need accurate temperature and humidity in each zone. One of the questions that came in before the webinar is, do you need control in each room or can you do a zone with multiple rooms? For radiant heating, that would be fine. For radiant cooling, I would say don't do that. You wanna have a humidistat and a temperature sensor in every zone to make sure that there's not some sort of humidity event that would uh, bring you closer to dew point. You wanna make sure that you can turn off the zone valve that goes to every room uh, to make sure that you're not overcooling it if the humidity spikes. Then floor temperature sensors near the surface of the thermal mass. Another good one is right in the manifold cabinet to make sure that if the water's 45 degrees at the manifold, we don't wanna even have that go into the, the actively cooled surface. We wanna make sure that we close that zone valve because it's too cold. And then, uh, yeah, leaving the mechanical room is another good spot for that sensor. So for the geographical considerations here, uh, sometimes when we talk about radiant cooling, people will say, oh yeah, that sounds great for uh, Denver or for a very dry California city or something like that. Uh, here are just some of the projects that we know about with radiant cooling. And this is just from kind of the Ray Howe eyes. And I know that there are other manufacturers out there that have done projects that probably fit all of the gaps in between here. Uh, but radiant cooling is not a regional specific thing. This can be in the swamps of Louisiana or it can be in the mountains of Colorado, East Coast, West Coast. Uh, what you can do when you design a building to ASHRAE 55 and 62.1 is you can put that building anywhere in the world that you want. If you're controlling the humidity effectively, ventilation is right, and you're not uh, going above or below the temperature boundaries for the surfaces set by ASHRAE 55, you can put that building anywhere. It could be in the most humid area in the world. You're gonna have by modern building codes a vestibule and, and things like that to enter a commercial building anyway. So you cover a lot of these things that in the past might have been scary about radiant cooling without even setting uh, a new rule here. Okay, so for a couple projects that I like to talk about, one of my favorites, uh, I think I've said that a few times because this is one of my favorite topics, um, but the Loyola University Information Commons is kind of a, a big library building. So it's right on uh, the lake there. And the way that they wanted to build it is that you can almost see all the way through it. So it's two kind of uh, stone buildings on the side with just a big glass box in between. So when the students come in, they can see straight through to the lake. And the, uh, the quote that we had from this is that we understand that if you're going to be in a building for hours and hours, comfort has to be the main consideration. That goes from temperature, humidity, and ventilation systems down to seating and lighting. 
So uh, that was Peter Schilt uh, when he was uh, working on this project, a Chicago-based uh, firm, Solomon, Cordwell, and, and Bunce at the time. Um, so another cool thing about this is 200 days a year, the building runs with natural ventilation and only the radiant heating and cooling floors and ceilings are used for the sensible load. So operable windows on the east and west side of the building open based on the indoor outdoor conditions. And uh, it's pretty cool because it's 48% glass that they're able to do this. So excellent, excellent integration of the engineering, the architects and mechanical, uh, work together. They actually did precast panels and integrated the lights and everything into those and then just came and plugged them in. So you can see in the pictures here, you don't see a lot of bulky duct work because it's all uh, hidden in these in these panels that are cooled for the ceilings and the floors. So really cool project. The architect was SCB in Chicago. Uh, the engineers that were involved, uh, TransSolar, I think was the, the lead for the building envelope, and then Alara. Uh, Pepper Construction was the GC and the mechanical contractor was the Hill Group. So great job with that project, really uh, a fun way to use radiant heating and radiant cooling. Uh, University of Washington is a similar project. So they, uh, the quote we have here from uh, the project manager, Matt Allen at McKinstry, I believe the focus on minimum ventilation and then doing heating and cooling through passive hydronic systems, uh, long-term benefits are energy savings. It's better for the environment and your wallet in that sense. So another really fun uh, school project. We've seen a lot of traction in the, the school. So architects, Perkins and Will, affiliated engineers, the engineering firm, uh, Skanska, general contractor, and then McKinstry was the mechanical contractor. So I'll go through these last couple projects here and then we'll have some time for questions. Uh, Sheridan Davis, Campus. So this is a, a living laboratory of sorts where they have uh, the students actually helped put this together. It's it's kind of a trade school. So they have a tri-generation plant producing electricity, hot and cold water, and then they do radiant heating and radiant cooling throughout. So they uh, were able to save 30% on consumption. Uh, they have a DOAS system for the forced air component, and then it's a it's a hands-on system that the students can actually see how you can effectively heat and cool this big atrium with radiant really well uh, and is is a fun way to see that technology live a little bit more than just in the mechanical room. The Toronto Elm Center. So this was uh, a win for another kind of different set of reasons. So one of the things that the end user loved about this eventually is that they used to change 1,200 air filters each year, but they built this building with radiant heating and radiant cooling. And now the maintenance staff doesn't need to gain entry to all of these different rooms at the YWCA to change filters all the time. So they're still moving some you know, air throughout these spaces as well, but it was a big long-term benefit to the facilities people to have the radiantly heat cooled slabs that don't really require any maintenance other than you know, mopping occasionally or whatever. So uh, this one was able to save 45% per year on carbon emissions, which is very cool. This was a project that uh, Mark Utenier at Climatrol worked on uh, and uh, another one of our favorites, uh, again, in a, in Toronto, which isn't one of the, the driest cities on earth either. So the this is an outlier project. <laughs> so the uh, high altitude aviation training site, HATS, uh, in Gypsum, Colorado, this is a radiantly heated and radiantly cooled aviation hangar. So the entire side of this building opens up so they can bring in big planes and helicopters and things like that. Traditionally a bad idea for radiant cooling, but because it's so dry there and the loads were so small, they don't need to get this ice cold, uh, it was a good fit. So kind of a, an interesting application, definitely not the norm, but something that we were able to work within the, the design uh, criteria to provide radiant cooling to this, uh, this big hangar. Then the last project profile that I'll talk about, uh, Earth Rangers in Woodbridge, Ontario. So this system is kind of uh, like a, a veterinary place that uh, one of the things that they liked about it, it eliminated, quote, eliminated duct work in which animals can hide. So this one, outside of the aesthetics of it, they, whatever birds or bats, or I don't know what they're actually working on here, but they didn't have the place to hide, so they were just cooling the, the ceilings and the floors, and it was a, a better fit for this particular project 
so these are some of the kind of interesting things to think about with radiant heating and radiant cooling projects. Each different site is going to be very different, but hopefully in this presentation I've identified some things to look for because I think the benefit of the comfort and the energy efficiency really is worth a second look for new projects that you're uh, working on as engineers or contractors or wherever you are in the market. Uh, radiant cooling can solve a lot of problems and is definitely not something to be afraid of. The humidity concerns that come up first question all the time. Just follow ASHRAE 55 and 62.1 modern you know, building codes and you're going to be in good shape to really utilize this technology in all, all different places in the world. So that's all I have for today. Um, all right. It. Well, I think with that, unless anybody else has any other comments, we want to thank everybody for attending today and certainly we'll be back with some more information and uh, let us know what we can do to help as far as you know upcoming topics if this was something of interest and we should continue on with a, maybe an advanced series of it let us know uh, i think the team with there at Rayhow would be glad to do that but uh, any other topics that come to mind uh, for uh, coffee with cluffy or hydronics issues coming up let us know we want to uh, we want to help you folks out there so thanks again team Rayhow, and uh, everybody stay safe out there thanks guys thank you thanks a bunch